Okay, today we're going to look at the NES and some of its popular hardware revisions. We're going to talk about the launch of the Famicom and the North American NES and cover all the basics, so here we go. Of course, like usual, it all starts in Japan. This is the Famicom. This is Nintendo's first cartridge-based system. Now, Nintendo was not new to video games at the time. They'd obviously had some success with arcade games, and they had actually a lot of Pong clones for the home, but they hadn't had a standalone cartridge-based system yet, and this was their first. This is the Famicom. This was launched in Japan July 15th, 1983. Now, remember, this did not come with Super Mario Brothers. Super Mario Brothers was not invented yet, but a lot of popular Nintendo arcade games like Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye were launched with this system in 1983. Taking a look at the system itself, you can see it's very small. It's, it's much smaller than the NES that we know over here. But essentially this is the exact same system. It has all the same processors inside. It runs all the same games. The controllers are very similar, though they're actually hardwired on the Famicom. The only really difference in the controllers is on controller 2, you have a microphone. And that was used in some games in Japan. Of course, there was no microphone on the NES controllers over here. Games go in top like so. This is what they look like. Once again, not only is the console much smaller, but the cartridges themselves are much smaller. This is Super Mario Brothers, copyright 1985. As you can see that loads in like so. I have a power, a reset button, an eject button in the middle. You could almost argue that this is uh, a, a similar design to uh, the Super Nintendo with the power button here, reset button, you know, the eject button in the middle, uh, and being a top loading system. System specs are as follows, and they are the same on the Famicom as they are on the NES. Like I said, despite this looking drastically different on the outside, it's essentially the same thing on the inside. Now, on the Famicom itself, they had to add a controller port on the front because the controllers were hardwired. So if you wanted to plug in an extra controller or a zapper gun, you needed to have a, you know, an extra controller port on the front. Um, on the back, we have basically just RF out. So this is how the system came out in Japan. Obviously, they made some major changes for North America. For one, they didn't think parents would pay, you know, $150, $250 for a system that looked like a toy. So Nintendo wanted to launch the NES in North America. Obviously, like I said, they wanted to redesign it make it look like it wasn't a toy. But there was also the fact that in North America in 1983, the video game industry pretty much hit rock bottom. You know, there were so many bad games coming out for the Atari 2600 that people just stopped buying video games in general. Video game sales 1983 to 1985 were pretty much non-existent. So Nintendo didn't want to release the NES and, you know, have it fail. So they had to sort of do a test run first. The NES was released in North America October 1985, but this was in New York City only. It wasn't until 1986 that it was released all across North America. Now, they sold it originally in two versions. There was the control deck. The control deck was $129.95. It came with basically just the console, two controllers, and Super Mario Brothers. They also had the deluxe set. The deluxe set was $249.99, but it came with Rob the Robot and Gyromite, and it came with the Zapper and Duck Hunt. So in November of 1988, Nintendo released the action set. Now the action set was the most popular selling version of the NES in North America. It was $149.99, it came with two controllers and the zapper, and it came with a multi-cart, Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt on one cartridge. Now I actually got an action set myself, 
and I'm not sure exactly when, if it was uh, probably around 1989, when most people I know started to get the NES, they were all getting the action set. Pretty much everyone I knew with an NES got the action set. I don't know, actually know anyone who got the earlier deluxe set with Rob the Robot. Um, everyone I knew got it like this. Of course, we have all the books here. The system itself, which we'll take a look at in a minute. Two controllers. Here's another neat uh, accessory that it came with, and that's the Zapper. You can see copyright 1985 Nintendo. The Zapper actually was originally gray. When they first came out, they were gray. Um, I'm assuming that's with the deluxe sets, when they came out earlier with the deluxe sets. Um, uh, and then, of course, what happened was they realized that, uh, you know, a toy gun shouldn't be gray, so they made it bright orange, so it's impossible to confuse this with a real gun. We should probably take another look at the controller because I didn't really talk about the controller. The controller for the time was actually pretty revolutionary because of one thing. This D-pad. At the time, if you look at the Atari 2600 and you look at the 5200, even the 7200, they all had some form of a joystick. And then you had stuff like the uh, Intellivision, which had a big round disc. Believe it or not, until the Famicom, there was no video game system that had a simple D-pad for the controller. Alright, so here's a look at the console itself and one of the games. Like I said, compared to the original Famicom from Japan, it's much bigger. And of course, the actual cartridges themselves are bigger. They're also a little bit different, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's got a weird front load design. Unfortunately, they ditched the top load design of the Famicom and they went with this strange front load design. Now, this meant that the game had to be pushed in to the pin contacts, but it actually only makes contact with, I believe it's the top row of pins, until you push it down. So it has this complicated spring-loaded door mechanism and uh, un unfortunately it's less reliable over time as most people now know. A top loading system generally has less problems reading the cartridges than these front loading systems do. Power and reset buttons on the front, two controller ports on the front. Unlike the Famicom, now we have, you know, separate controller ports. The controllers aren't hardwired. Now, on the back of the system we have our simple AC input and our RF output with the channel select. But like I said, the NES also has composite video. It has AV outputs on it. Now like I said, all the hardware in here is basically the same in the Famicom and in the NES. And in some cases they're running the same game. You know, if you could take the ROM chip out of this and, and, and this, Super Mario Brothers, it's pretty much the same. The only difference is, like I said, there is a difference between the cartridges here, is actually inside. The Famicom used a 60-pin connector to connect the game cartridge to the system, and the NES uses a 72-pin connector. So what are the extra pins for? Well, four of them are for a chip that's in the NES that's not in the Famicom, and that's called the 10 NES chip. When they started to bring the NES over to North America, they realized that they should be worried about piracy and people releasing non-licensed games. So they put a chip inside the NES called the 10 NES chip to help prevent the system from playing pirated games. So four of the pins inside an NES cartridge line up with the 10 NES chip inside the system. And that's strictly to prevent pirate games from running inside the NES. 10 of the pins pretty much pass through to what would have been an expansion port on the bottom. Now, obviously they never used the expansion port, in fact, they pretty much just covered it right up with plastic. But if you break this plastic piece off, you'll actually see a connector underneath, which could have been used for well, who knows, quite frankly, disk drive systems, modems, any kind of expansion. And the two extra pins 
would have been used for sound enhancement chips inside the cartridge. The Famicom Disk System had that. It had an FM uh, chip inside the uh, Famicom Disk System that some games would use for enhanced music. They could have done that over here, but they took it out. But, you know, originally in the design, they had it planned so that some of the games, if they wanted to, could use the enhanced FM chip inside the cartridge. Okay, so that's, again, what some of the extra pins in the 72 pin versus the 60 pin are used for. Now, since the expansion port was never used, since the um, FM sound was never used, the only part of the extra pins here is for the 10 nest chip and well you can get away with getting around the 10 nest chip with something like this this is a 72 to 60 pin adapter and this lets you play your Famicom games in your NES now this came out in 1993 and it was basically designed to be a cost-reduced version of the NES, so Nintendo could keep selling the NES, keep selling NES games, but make a little bit more off the console. It's a cool little design, and of course, it's now a top loader. Now unfortunately on the back of the NES 2 top loader here, they took off the AV outputs. There's no AV outputs on this top loader here. It's only got RF. And not only does it only have RF, but the picture quality that comes off the RF here is actually worse than the picture quality that comes off the RF on the NES, let alone the great picture quality you're going to get with the AV. So yes, this was a cost reduced version, it does not have AV out on it, and the picture quality off the RF itself is not as good. Last but not least, we have our clone here. Now, Clones became very popular much earlier than you might think, and, well, quite frankly, for different reasons. Now we buy clones because our old systems are expensive, and they're broke down, and they're hard to find, so some people will say, okay, I'm going to buy a $15, $20 clone system to play my games on. But back in the day, some people bought clones because they had no choice. Let's take a look at the Dandy Famicom. You see, Nintendo never sold the Nintendo or the Famicom in certain countries, especially in the Soviet Union. So, if you lived in the Soviet Union in the late 80s, early 90s, and you wanted to play Nintendo games, you couldn't just go to the store and buy a real Nintendo. So what they sold there was clones. Way back then, they were selling clones. But it was basically because you had to buy a clone. It wasn't because you wanted to buy a clone. Now this little clone system here works alright. It's got AV output on it. It works with the real NES controllers. Um, and, you know, it plays 90% of the games. There's some games that don't work with clones. Uh, also, the sound isn't exactly perfect. But overall, it does the job. Now, I don't recommend a clone over the real thing. But I guess some people just don't like worrying with the old systems and if they're going to work and if they have to clean them. The top loader here still works pretty well, but these are really hard to find and they're sometimes pretty expensive. So, some people still like to buy the clones. So basically what I've done here is made a big mess, but hopefully you've learned something. <laughs> I think most of you are familiar with the NES and the games, games like Super Mario Brothers. Before Super Mario Brothers, there weren't a lot of games on home consoles that we called side-scrolling platformers. You look at the original Mario Brothers arcade, you look at the Donkey Kong arcade, you look at Space Invaders, you look at Pac-Man, they're all fixed screen games. Now Super Mario Brothers wasn't the first side-scrolling platformer. What you got with Super Mario Brothers was a game that looked like nothing you had seen before. Graphics were amazing. The side scrolling was smooth. You had these giant levels like you've never seen before. You had music, great music on a home console video game like you've never heard before. All on a great controller, which gave you the precision like you've never felt before. It was really Super Mario Brothers that sold the NES and it was really the NES that essentially saved the video game industry as we know it.